Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of The Spear by James Herbert. Dane reads. So as always, I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs. I don't have a huge number of them, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, The Spear. When Stedman agreed to investigate the disappearance of a young Mossad agent, he had no idea he would be drawn into a malevolent conspiracy of neo-Nazi cultists bent on unleashing an age-old unholy power on an unsuspecting world. Power rising out of a demonic relic from man's dark primal past to threaten humanity with horror beyond any nightmare. The Spear. So uh, this is kind of an interesting one to read at the moment just because we have um, like more trouble in the Middle East between the Israelis and the Palestinians and this obviously deals heavily with uh, Judaism and it does cover Mossad and various other groups and stuff. So we got an Adolf Hitler quote near the start. There are actually Hitler quotes towards the start of a lot of the chapters. So I'm going to read this one. For myself, I have the most intimate familiarity with Wagner's mental processes. At every stage in my life, I come back to him. Only a new nobility can introduce the new civilization for us. If we strip Parsifal of every poetic element, we learn from it that selection and renewal are possible only amid the continuous tension of a lasting struggle. A worldwide process of segregation is going on before our eyes. Those who see and struggle the meaning of life gradually mount the steps of a new nobility. Those who are in search of peace and order through dependence sink, whatever their origin, to the inert masses. The masses, however, are doomed to decay and self-destruction. In our world revolutionary turning point, the masses are the sum total of the sinking civilization and its dying representatives. We must allow them to die with their kings like Amfortas. I don't know too much about uh, Wagner, unfortunately. And I want to read this bit out as well. Uh, this bit's uh, like the prologue's taking part in 1945. And I want to read the kind of the ending here of this, uh, this part. They begin to search him, running their fingers through the hair on his head and pubic regions. They examined his ears and the cracks between each toe. They spread his buttocks and checked his anal passage. Nothing was found, but there was still one area unsearched, and this was the most obvious hiding place. The doctor ordered the prisoner to open his mouth. Captain Wells saw the black file immediately, between a gap in the German's teeth on the right-hand side of his lower jaw, and with a shout of alarm thrust his fingers into the open mouth. But the German was too quick. He wrenched his head to one side, biting down hard on the medic's fingers as he did so. Colonel Murphy and Sergeant Major Austin leapt forward and threw the struggling prisoner to the floor, the doctor holding him by the throat, squeezing with both hands, trying to force him to spit the capsule out. It was too late though, the file had been cracked and the poison was already finding its way into the man's system. His death was inevitable, but still they fought to prevent it. Colonel Murphy told the sergeant to find a needle and cotton as quickly as possible, and valuable minutes were lost as the interrogation centre was turned upside down in the search for such trivial articles. The doctor kept his pressure on the prisoner's throat, but the death spasms were already beginning. The sergeant soon returned, and it was the steady hands of the intelligence chief that had to thread the needle and cotton. While Sergeant Austin forced the dying man's mouth open, the colonel grasped the slippery tongue and pierced it with a needle. By pulling on the thread, they were able to hold the tongue out from the mouth, preventing it from blocking the throat. For 15 minutes, they used emetics, a stomach pump, and every method of artificial respiration. It was no use. The three men had prevented the cyanide from killing with its usual swiftness, but they had only delayed death. The prisoner's body contorted into one last spasm of agony, his face hideous in its torment. Then his body slumped into stillness. Two days later, Sergeant Major Austin wrapped the corpse in army blankets, wound camouflage netting tied with telephone wire around it, and buried the body in an unmarked grave near Lunenburg. The final resting place of Reichsführer SS Heinrich Himmler was never recorded. This is a bit typical. Uh, I uh, just th thought this was interesting. The only bills he paid any attention to were the red ones. The others he crumpled and dropped on the floor. A letter from an ex-girlfriend made him groan aloud. She had grown tired of being an ex just as quickly as she had of being current and now thought it would be super if they got together again. That letter too soon lay crumpled at his feet. And then he finds somebody um, nailed like crucified to a door and we get this pretty, pretty brutal scene here. He eased Maggie's body down as gently as he could, then ran into the kitchen and threw open a cupboard where he kept his work tools. He found a hammer and raced back down the hallway, his heart pounding, his fear rising. Her torn clothes were covered in blood, most of which seemed to have come from her mouth. Stedman eased himself past her and with one arm around her body, pushed the forked end of the hammer underneath the nail head with his free hand. He tried to pull the nail out without using the back of her hand as a lever, but it was deeply embedded. He had to let her go and use both hands. Maggie's body slumped again and he pulled at the hammer with all his strength, a cry of relief escaping him as he finally wrenched the bloody nail clear. He tried to catch her as her body fell sideways, prevented from falling completely to the ground by the nail in her other hand. Stedman let her go and again gave all his energy to yanking out the other nail. It was embedded deep into her hand and he had to push the hammer's fork into the skin to gain a grip. It made him nauseous to do so but he knew he had no choice. He had to get her free as quickly as possible. Unfortunately, it's a little bit too little too late. 
And we get this, which I think is more interesting to read as a modern reader, because obviously Nazism and the far right are growing probably more than they were when this was written. I mean, this was published, I think, 80s? This copy was, anyway. First published 78, this edition was 86. Are you aware of the growing revival of Nazism throughout the world, Harry? Perhaps not, because it goes under many different names and guises. You may imagine such fanaticism could never become a threat again after the last world war, but you'd be wrong. It's a cancer spreading throughout the world, a parasite feeding on political unrest, poverty and terrorist activity. Do you know, for example, that an extreme right-wing group from Belgium known as the Flemish New Order are fighting with the UDA in Ireland? They're not alone. You'll find other right-wing groups encouraging wars and becoming involved in them in many countries, supplying money, supplying arms. And one of the characters is a freelance writer. She's doing a feature on arms dealers for one of the Sunday magazines. Certainly sounds a lot more intense than the work I do as a freelance writer. And another Adolf Hitler quote here, very chilling. Terrorism is absolutely indispensable in every case of the foundling of new power. We get a head hop here and there, so we get like, the guard whose legs felt numb and lifeless from the blow they had received, raised himself onto his elbows and tried to grab at the gun. And then we go straight back into Stedman's point of view. And um, I mean, I've just always been told that that's a sign of bad writing. Uh, this is another Adolf Hitler quote, which I think is spookily relevant today, uh, especially with the rise of, you know, the, the right, essentially. Uh, and Because he's talking about England here. And this is very true, like, the biggest nightmare of our Conservative Party, who's currently in power, is like the oiks, the general public, rising up against them, you know? But for some reason, they seem to be popular, even though, like, people vote for pol policy makers who will screw them over. And I don't, I don't get it personally, but anyway. So Hitler said, One day ceremonies of thanksgiving will be sung to fascism and national socialism for having preserved Europe from a repetition of the triumph of the underworld. That's a danger that especially threatens England. The conservatives would face a terrible ordeal if the proletarian masses were to seize power. Fanaticism is a matter of climate. Think about that if you're planning on voting conservative in the next election. That's what, what would Hitler do? He would vote conservative. Which is funny because my, my, my nan votes Conservative, but she said she wouldn't vote Labour back when Jeremy Corbyn was their, uh, the leader of the Labour Party. She wouldn't vote Labour because Jeremy Corbyn looks bad in a suit. For one, have you seen Boris Johnson in a suit? Because it's not like he looks great in a suit. And number two, like, that implies that she would have voted the Nazis because they had nice uniforms. I'd vote on policies myself. And so here we get this because it turns out that this secret society, the Thule Society, um, is being led by like, Himmler, basically. The society had remained in the shadows for so many years, but the time was coming for the strong leaders to emerge. They would rule, and the military would no longer be the puppets of weak men. No longer would the country's defences be whittled away by the weaklings in government. No longer would the leftists be allowed to dominate. That kind of destructive freedom was to end in England. It had to if the nation was to survive. Of course, the identity of their true leader would never be revealed, for it would be abhorrent to the people who had so misguidedly fought against his great ideals in the last world war and they would never allow themselves to be ruled by someone they thought had perished so many years before. And then we get this delightful little scene here. I just want to read out because this is uh, Herbert doing his thing where he's pretty good at writing these like brutal descriptions of scenes. Stedman saw his intention and stepped forward, his right arm outstretched, reaching for the weapon. Gant was faster. He picked up the silver dagger and began to bring it up, the wicked point aimed at the stooped investigator's chest. Stedman grabbed it at the wrist holding the knife and deflected its direction, using his own strength to continue the upward arc. The blade sank up to the hilt into a point just below Gant's breastbone. He stared disbelievingly at Stedman, his fingers still curled around the dagger's handle, the investigator's hand still gripped around his wrist, and there was a moment of absolute silence between them. One side of Gant's face was popping and blistering, a scorched eyelid covering one eye. The gaping wound where his nose had once been was weeping fresh blood. And then the arms dealer screamed and fell forward, his chest coming to rest against his knees, the dagger's hilt between them, his forehead touching the cold stone floor as though he were paying homage to the victor. Blood gurgled up from his throat and created a thick red pool around his head, and he died in that position, his body refusing to topple onto its side, escaping gas from his abdomen, taking any last shred of dignity from his dying. So yeah, all in all, The Spear by James Herbert, it was okay. Uh, I think. I mean, this was kind of earlier on, but the whole Thule Society Nazi uh, link thing has been done to death in, in fiction, I find. But um, yeah, he did okay at it. It was more of a sort of espionage slash supernatural spy thriller than anything else. So um, I gave it like a weak 3.5 out of 5. It was nowhere near as good as The Fog or The Rats, but it was better than The Survivor. And hey-ho, I'll continue reading James Herbert. 
So there we have it, that's what I made of the spear. As always, don't forget to let me know what you thought of this book if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.